Why is it that some channels will grow to millions of views every month, millions of subscribers, develop just a really hardcore, dedicated, loyal audience of fans and look like they have unstoppable momentum? But then yet at some point, those channels, they, they start to plateau, they flatline, and then they even start to decline. Today, we want to talk about what some of those mistakes are because they're common mistakes and ones that can easily be avoided, especially earlier on in a channel's growth trajectory, if you know what they are. Hey, welcome to the Video Creators Podcast. You know how you put a lot of time and energy into your YouTube channel for not nearly enough growth? Yeah, we get it. We're here today to help you change that. Hello, creators. How are you guys? It's great to have you again for another Video Creators Podcast episode like we have here every week just to help you continue to grow your YouTube channel so you can reach more people, change their lives with the message that you're spreading, and grow a successful business around it all at the same time. Today for this episode, I'm joined with two of the YouTube strategists um, on our team here at Video Creators, now presented to you by VidIQ. We have Ingrid from North Carolina. Hello, Ingrid. How are you? Hello. And we have Sam Wittick from Florida. How are you doing yes. today, Sam? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. All three of us have been working a lot with creators, um, big and small. We've seen a lot of these things happen, um, regardless of size. But they they they're most noticeable though in in the in the larger channel. So uh, we're going to talk about those mistakes here with you today. But first of all, we want to do our creator spotlight. Introduce you to a creator named Faith Womack. She has been working very hard on her channel. Um, Sam, can you tell us a little bit about what she's doing on YouTube? I know you talked with her recently. Yeah, yeah. So Faith. Faith has a, a, a Bible study channel for for women who are just looking to dive deeper into that. So she just recently uh, graduated the Video Labs course. So she really entered in just with a lack of structure and strategy. And it was kind of the classic throwing spaghetti at the wall and just kind of seeing what works and what doesn't work. So, um, yeah, she just recently jumped through in there and uh, is starting to see some success. So really excited about about that. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry. I'm stuck in this visual of throwing spaghetti against the wall. I, we say that all the time, and I'm like, who does that, though? <laughs> so, I have seen yeah, it happen in uh, real life, by the way. If another you have story a two-year-old, you probably will. Yeah. <laughs> I used to do uh, it to test to test whether the pasta was cooked right. Really? Oh, really? If it sticks, yes. that means it's cooked right? Yes, exactly. I wonder if that will <laughs> I went to, like, no joke, I went to an Italian restaurant and the guy behind the counter got really angry and threw spaghetti at the wall. Maybe he was <laughs> testing it or he just was taking out his rage. I don't know. Uh, but, maybe that's why that's a, that's a figure of speech for testing things. Maybe. Which is going to huh. tie in exactly to our conversation here in, yeah. in a little bit. But here's a little bit of, of Faith uh, Womack's story and uh, to help encourage you as you move forward with your journey. Before Video Labs, I always really wanted to take the course, but the price was something that really intimidated me. And I wasn't sure if it was just one of the other kind of YouTube growth courses that make a lot of promises and then don't really deliver, or they're so boring that you can't make it through them. However, Video Labs was really intuitive and really natural. Tim, you can tell, really put a lot of thought into each one of the lessons. And then on top of it, going through the app volley and talking with everybody and having that accountability. And it, it, I mean, there's no, this is a boring course that you're just like struggling to get through. It was very comfortable. And I like learned so much more than I ever expected in the course. I thought it was like value times three, but, um, then now I, now that I'm out of video labs, I feel so much more confident when I'm planning my videos and thinking about my content. I actually took a few of the worksheets that y'all gave us through the course and I printed off like 200 copies of them and they sit on my desk. And every time I sit down to plan one of my videos, I work through that story structure or I work through the questions and just kind of the thought processes. And I feel so much more confident when I'm going through planning my month ahead of the videos I'm going to make or whatever. Although I need to do that more. I have all the <laughs> tools and everything that I need from this course. And it's now integral in the way that I think about video making. So that's been priceless. But to top it off, also the channel reviews were like priceless. I took yours, Sam, that you did on my channel and I saved it to my computer and I've watched it over like at least three times. I'm taking notes and I'm rewatching it. 
because that is like so personalized to my channel on top of all the stuff that we already talked about that applies to all channels. It just is the perfect combo to go together and to have other people look at my channel as outsiders who aren't familiar with my niche and to say, you know what? I think this would be better is just amazing because they have their own takes. They're in their tech niche or they're in the, I don't know, one of them was in like the RV niche and she had great points and I was just blown away by it all. So um, not only did I learn so much, but I feel more confident and stronger walking away now as a YouTube creator and even just in the vision for my channel in the future. Here at Video Creators, we love working with creators like Faith, and we would love to work with you too. In fact, we'd love to get into a quick 15-minute discovery call session with you just to hear more about your story, what you're working on with your channel, what's worked, what doesn't work, and, and, and see if there's a way that we can support you and help you along your journey, whether that's doing video labs like Faith did or just doing a one-hour session with us or um, a longer-term client arrangement, whatever whatever you need. That's what we just want to hear, like how can we serve you? There's a completely free. So you just go to videocreators.com slash discovery call or find a link in the show notes of this episode too and find a schedule. Actually, Sam's doing most of them right now. So you can find a time on Sam's schedule and uh, talk with Sam for a little bit and he'd love to he'd love to hear from you. So videocreators.com slash discovery call and Sam will talk with you soon. Ingrid, Sam, I feel like every time I look at my calendar and I see that I have a consultation coming up with a 2 million plus subscriber channel, I can I can usually predict, oh, I know exactly what we're talking about here. Really? <laughs> it's, it's, it's no longer, they have different questions. They hold different set of, of, of issues and challenges that, they, that they're facing. Um, and, and, the, and the calls at that point are almost always, this used to work, but it's no longer working. I haven't changed anything. I'm doing the same thing I've always done, but why am I not getting why am I not getting the traction I once used to get? And often I'm like, exactly, because you're doing the same thing, you know. <laughs> like uh, yeah. it worked then. And I think kind of the the overarching principle for our our conversation here is something that stood out to me a long time ago. So the thing that got you here is not the thing that will get you there. The thing that you did to get to this point was great. It worked for getting here, but you're going to need mm-hmm. a different strategy. You're going to need a different approach for going forward into in, to continuing to gain momentum and, and grow your channel. And one of the first mistakes I think that these big creators make is that they often just stop experimenting. They usually, when the channel is small and it's and it's young, they're trying a lot of different things. They're they they feel like they they have a lot to learn, and so they feel like they have this ability to do different things and and like well that didn't work let's try this thing and they and they're pivoting and sometimes like really significant pivots and just trying different and then when something starts working it almost becomes a curse to the channel because on one hand it's great because it's working and people or uh, these creators see like this is what i need to do to finally get momentum and like and then they just rinse and repeat that and they just keep doing it over and over again and it keeps getting results and so they're like yay i found the thing i was trying to find but then a few years later they're stuck in a rut and they forget that like not even a good television series will last more than seven seasons before it gets replaced with a new show and and people just get bored and they need something they need fresh and so that ability to continually innovate and try new things uh, and evaluate like what does version 2.0 of my content look like now and um, what what is what does that need what does that look like uh, is something that's really important I think one of the channels I look to that's uh, that's done the best at this has continued to grow and experiment is Dude Perfect, uh, one of my favorite YouTube channels. You know, they started just by doing trick shots, but then they they pivot and they're constantly trying new new different different series. Whether it be Overtime, which is more of a variety show that they've been doing that uh, has has worked. Um, doing Bucket List is another series that has worked. Not really having too much to do with trick shots anymore, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But they also have done other series and other experiments that have not done as well with behind the scenes things and. And, uh, members only content and things. So I see them continually trying things. And if it doesn't do well, they just don't do it again. Or maybe they try it two or three times. If they keep getting the same results, they stop. Um, and then things that do work well, they double down on it and continue. So uh, I find that experimenting is, is really, really important. But it often feels scary, right? Especially if you're a larger channel. 
I'd love to hear from you too. How do how do you recommend that creators push through that and experiment in a way that doesn't feel as risky on their channel? Because the risk the, the 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 risk is like if I can't keep if I do something different, my channel will no longer grow, and my audience will hate me. I guess so. Yeah. What advice <laughs> do you have for them? Well, I feel like you know, and you're talking about Dude Perfect, and I also think of like Good Mythical Morning. They also uh, try Link, yeah. lots, yeah, Rhett and Link, they try lots of different things. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen also creators, sometimes they have like a second channel and sometimes they'll even try things there because it's not quite mm. as scary, right? But I've worked with a lot of creators too that may not be quite at that 2 million mark, but even, you know, a couple hundred thousand, it feels, that's everything, that's their business. Mm. So it feels odd to throw a wrench into something that has worked well for so long. But there's a lot of competition on YouTube and you have to stay fresh. And just because you've been doing something really well for three years, if you experimented a little bit more, could you have bigger growth even? Yeah. Or get yourself out of that rut. So one of the things that I've recommended to clients is to go back to primal branding. You know, are you really connecting with your audience on that primal branding level. Because a lot of times it just becomes, you know, and I've, I think of like a cooking channel that I've worked with. It became about the recipe and getting the viewer from beginning to end. And you get so caught up in the analytics of it all that you work out the personality of it. You know, you need to for bring people, that connection. For people who aren't familiar with primal branding, can you give us a quick synopsis of what that is? Or what, Sam, what it accomplishes? you want to jump in here? Yeah, because yeah, I know that this is branding. one of your big things. I feel like the easiest way to describe primal branding is I always think of like, maybe this is a weird way to think about it, but I think of if my YouTube channel and my videos could be like a rock climbing wall and there needs to be these little like handhold latches for a first time viewer mm -hmm. to grab on and actually have a connection with me and not just the thing that I'm talking about. I think of the primal branding elements as really easy latches for somebody just to have a line of connection. So primal branding can be anything from a little bit of my backstory. Um, it could be maybe some rituals or maybe some insider language. You know, it's we talk about the Starbucks example all the time of, you know, they don't do small, medium, large. They do tall, venti, grande, whatever it is. But there are these little <laughs> things that are incorporated into their brand that makes the, the first time viewer walk through the door and feel like they belong. And there's some kind of a deeper connection happening here. Yeah, that connection part is really important. Uh, it, it, not not just in with experimenting with new content ideas and new show ideas, but refreshing the the signals you're giving to people that make it easy for them to connect with you, uh, which is what primal branding is is all about. And uh, you know, I, I look at some of these musicians who have stood the test of time. It, it seems like every album they have is kind of like it's a different sound, so they've kind of reinvented themselves a little bit. But they've also reinvented their brand in a way of, of like it's a different story that they're telling about themselves. There's different creeds and beliefs and rituals. And and so there it seems like every year and a half to two years, these these music bands um, are, are redoing. It. And I would say the same is true for the personal brands of like Hollywood actors and actresses who are also reinventing their personal brand to continue to stay relevant and and be booked in more and more shows and, and, and movies. So um, I think for YouTube creators, I think it's important that we don't get stuck in a rut. We continually keep experimenting with new ideas, not just format and show wise, but branding wise too, uh, in terms of the, the, the stories and the, and the, and the beliefs people are, are connecting to for sure. Yeah. Um, and that kind of goes into this next mistake that people make that these larger creators are often mistaking niche for brand. When I think about niche, I think of niche as being about the topic. It's the subject matter that you talk about. Like Ingrid, you have a channel that is in the mixed media uh, niche, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, but that's not your brand, mm -mm. right? So 
I'm putting you on the spot here, but you are. Can you just <laughs> can you describe your your and for people who don't know, Ingrid has <laughs> is it the largest or one? Of, I know it's one of the no, largest. Just is it the one largest? of the one of the larger channels. Yeah, in the mixed media space, every niche yeah. uh, has different size audiences and things, right? And in that space, hers is one of the largest. So what what what's your niche is mixed media, like making mm-hmm. cards and things for people, but which I have some, they're amazing. And then, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) What's the difference between that and your brand? Well, my brand, you know, it's really, mixed media is just what we do. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's just something that we have in common. That's how we're connecting. But my channel is really about inspiring you uh, to actually not just create something that you're going to fall in love with, but connect with the people that you love. It's Mm -hmm. about helping you get past those roadblocks that keep you from connecting. It's about pulling elements of life into your art. It's something that's way beyond just the actual art that you create. Yeah. So these larger creators, they think I make videos about blank and they get stuck there. And what, what, what we're saying is that it's about more like your brand is about what you believe. It's about who you mm-hmm. are. It's about the people you're connecting with. It's about uh, what connects with those people and, um, and not just talking about a topic all the time, so to say. Yeah. It's also making me think of um, that channel, Yes Theory. Personally, I'm a huge fan of Yes Theory, but um, for those who aren't familiar, their whole value proposition, their whole channel revolves around this mission that they call Seek Discomfort. So they basically are pursuing either activities or things that will put them intentionally in uncomfortable situations to either grow as a human being or experience life a little bit more fully. But that is the whole mission of their YouTube channel. And so when it comes to the actual content buckets of, you know, I guess the what of what we're talking about, they do all kinds of different videos. They, they travel, they go to really extreme locations or they eat crazy food or they do these more kind of social challenges like, um, you know, trading a penny for like a plane ticket or something like that. And so it's this big variety of different types of videos and they can keep it fresh that way so that they don't get stuck because, you know, I, I like the, the, the music example that you used him where it can be different types of music or different albums, but you can hear it and still be like, Oh yeah this is the Beatles. You know, you can watch one of these videos and be like, Oh yeah, this is yes theory. It makes sense. You know, they're, they're seeking discomfort, whether it's a travel video or they're eating some crazy food or something like that. Yeah. That, that seek discomfort is, is the creed. It's and that's what beliefs, that's what brands ultimately revolve around are are creeds, are are beliefs, not just niches or, or, or topics. When you focus on a niche, you end up blending in to every other channel. But when you become about seeking discomfort or if you're Ingrid, it's more about connecting with people. Like this isn't about making cards and mixed media art. This is about uh, creating something we're going to give to someone. It's about making a connection with that person. That that now separates you from all the other people in your, in, in, in your niche, right? I remember working with one channel uh, who would do uh, very similar story we've been talking about here, trying all these different things on a YouTube channel, nothing was growing. And then he found some like random weapons on Amazon and started and made some videos testing these random weapons. And that video went big. So he's like, okay. And so he got, so his whole channel, he fell into this rut of making, um, uh, videos experimenting and testing different weapons on Amazon. It gets to a point where they're like, what other videos am mm-hmm. I going to find here? Right. <laughs> yeah, or other, right. What other weapons am I going to find here that people would know about and, and click on? And so he's kind of getting to the end and he was known as the, you know, random weapons on Amazon guy. But in talking with him, he's like, I don't want to keep doing this. I'm stuck. I don't know what else to do. How do I, and, and at that, that point he had grown to about 800,000 subscribers and I started talking with him about like, well, how did you get started on YouTube? Tell, let's go back to the beginning. Tell me the story. Long story short, he remembers when what it felt like to come home to an empty apartment. His uh, single parent, his mom was working 
um, three jobs to make ends meet, and he just felt mostly invisible in middle school. And he remembers coming home, laying down on his bed in the empty apartment and watching YouTube and feeling like he was hanging out with the cool kids now. He was hanging out with those guys. And he started his channel originally because he wanted to help other people feel that way. But in the success, uh, he kind of he kind of lost that, kind of forgot that. And I'm like, dude, there's your mission. That's your creed. That's your belief right there. You know, and it's like, now you're not going to come right out and say like, if you're a lonely kid, I want to make you feel loved. Like, that would be creepy. Don't say that. Right. <laughs> uh, but instead he's like, you know what this is really about for me is just seeking adventure. Uh, uh, no, that's not what it, it was making every day. Awesome. Making every day. Awesome. And, uh, and so he's like, so, so he, so he pivoted by re rebranding his channel, or I should say rebranding it, but more about establishing what the brand is in the first place around making every day awesome. And, and so at first that was around continuing doing more weapons stuff from Amazon. But as people started learning of this is about making every day awesome, that actually opened up a lot of the new opportunities for different content styles, different topics to talk about, different things to experiment and try as long as, because now the through line that tied all the content together wasn't weapons on Amazon. It was making every day awesome. And because of that, then people didn't really care as much because they were there for the making every day awesome, not there. As much for the weapons. So they could, he could do, he had a lot more flexibility on his channel going forward. I feel like there's a practical lesson here though, um, because I do find that this is a mistake that a lot of YouTubers do make. You talked about pivoting a little bit, because this kind of ties a little bit into experimenting our first point and this one as well. You don't want to just go cold turkey and change everything right away. Yeah. So if you're, if you're going to make a pivot, Try it with one video, then keep doing a little bit about what you're doing, what you were doing and work some of it in. You know, you got to ease things in. Don't do just don't make a like a hard turn because that doesn't usually work out that well because then everybody's confused. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I remember working with one creator who had several million subs and uh, he had very he had a lot of success with with a certain style of content. It's pretty unique, so I don't want to mention what it is. Also, everyone will know who he is, and I don't have permission to tell the story. But um, <laughs> but he felt stuck. He's like, I can't do anything other than this, and if I do something else, nobody watches. And, but now it's my livelihood. I've got a team of people who depend on me for their income as well, And but I can't make any different type of content. I'm just bored of making this type of content. So how do I get out of this was, was the question. And he had made the same mistake as the Amazon weapons guy. He got stuck into a, and his brand was his format. That is not a brand. That is, that's a format should, you should not be that stuck. Um, and so we developed a creed for him too, that uh, was, became the through line for all of his videos. And that is seeking adventure wherever we can find it. So he had to keep doing his old style of videos for a while, but he was very, very, uh, animate that this is about seeking adventure wherever we can find it. It's not about this topic. And then after like a few months of that, then he made a different video that wasn't in the same niche, the same topic and subject matter. And that video did very well because with his audience, because those people knew that this wasn't about the, the niche he was in, the topic. This was about this creed. Um, and so a mistake is like mistaking niche for brand. It's very important that you don't get stuck in a format, but instead get stuck on, on a mission of some sort of creed. Cause that, uh, you know, whether it's seeking discomfort or seeking adventure, wherever it can be found, or it's, um, making every day a little bit more awesome or whatever it is, instead of making the same video over and over and over again, uh, about the topic, it's more like we're making every video uh, like we're leading the charge for this mission. And those channels continue to grow and do very well because that's those creeds are inherently emotional. They inherently make people feel something and it helps them connect on a deeper level to a brand that is about seeking adventure instead of it being about like this subject matter. Or it's about making everyday awesome, not just testing random weapons on uh, from Amazon. Um, but today that might be how we make the day awesome. So that, that's really important. The third thing is that these creators often fail to scale beyond themselves. They, uh, they end up, and we've, and we've t showed the story before, if you go back to my, my interview with um, 
Janae Thompson from the from the King of Random. We talked about her 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 late husband who started the channel, it, and his story is very common. Which is, hey, at that point he had six million subscribers. Now he's now the channel has twelve and a half million subscribers, and he's like, I'm working sixty eight hour, eighty hour weeks, and all the time for my family. No one else can edit the way I can. I tried hiring people, it didn't work, and they just these creators end up feeling stuck, like they can't give up their editing, they can't hand content over to a producer, they can't let go of their baby, they can't you know give up control or even develop a business around their content to make it sustainable, and so. Th- you can only go so long that way doing it solo or maybe with a small group of people before you just crash and burn and just don't keep going. So uh, Ingrid and Sam, what advice do you have for creators who are in that spot who are like, I don't think I can give this up. I can't scale this beyond myself. And because that feels risky, that's challenging. And that requires a lot of trust and trust takes time to build. So how would you help? What advice do you have for someone in that spot? It does take time to build. And I've worked with several creators that they just, everything that you just said, it's their baby. They can't give it up. Nobody can do it as good as I can. (laughs) That's usually what I hear. Um, But there's a wall that they're coming up against because they're only one person. They have a life. And if they keep going at that pace, they're going to burn themselves out or worse, something's going to happen. And then nobody's making content at all. You know, and if you think about, and this is something that I've heard you say before, Tim, um, what are the things that you don't like to do? And and hire somebody (laughs) to do them. I thought you were going to answer that. I'm like, (laughs) okay, I guess you kept going. (laughs) You know, and then hire somebody to do those things. And granted, we may love to edit, but how many hours does it take you? And I'm talking to all of you out there right now who spend hours editing your own material. If somebody was doing that for you, what could, how many more pieces of content could you create during that time? You know, and how much further can your channel grow? You know, could you even, you know, create a course if you have that kind of a, that kind of a business? You know, what are the opportunities that you're saying no to by saying yes to editing? You know, and that's really the thing that you have to think about. So how do you actually get, get past that? I would, you know, Hire a couple people as a test. And maybe you're even editing your own video. But just do it as a test. It's not necessarily going to be put out there, but you may be surprised at what you get in return. Where where would I go to find a test person, a test editor? Ooh. Well, there are I mean, nothing. I, I don't want to like derail you know, from I'm your line to, of thinking. I'm but. trying to think of what the new there's a new site at there's a new site that we just learned about. Um there's several new YouTube several hiring new sites. Ones. I don't know For any of them well enough to know if, if I want to plug any of them or not because I oh. don't know how good they are. But the the but the big ones people usually go to is Fiverr, Upwork, you know, places like that where you can just get a freelance editor for a while. Uh, for you could also go to Indeed, or, you know, right? Probably Indeed, put a posting yeah. if you want it, if you want an editor there as well. Yeah. But even even beyond just that, what about even thumbnails? If that's not your thing and you're not good at graphics, hire a thumbnail company or somebody to work on your thumbnails. Um, you know, is there somebody? Maybe you don't like the producing part of it. Can you bring in a producer to help? do all the organizations so that you could do all the things that you're good at and that you like to do. I think that's really the point is when you say yes to everything, you're saying no to everything else as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, you know, hearing that Ingrid, I would imagine some creators will hear that. And the first question that pops into their head is, if I hire somebody else to do it, it's, it's not going to be the same as if I do it. It's not going to be as good if uh, compared to how I would do it. And so I think, um, you know, when you're bringing the right people in, it's okay if it's not a hundred percent exactly how you do it. Um, if, if it's 80% of the way there, it's going to be good enough because that other 20%, your audience is not going to be able to tell the difference. <laughs> so it's going to be good enough if it's, if you can get, you know, leave them good detailed training and instructions and, you know, lay the groundwork so that when you hire the right person, they're going to do good work, but it's okay. If it's not going to be maybe exactly to the caliber that you would do it, 
But if somebody else can get you 80, 85% of the way there, and then like Ingrid, what you were saying, it, you could free up your time so that you can do so much more and you're not a bottleneck in these areas, it'll really help you get unstuck and continue to move forward. I did exactly what you just said, Sam, and it was the hardest thing that I ever did was handing my baby over to somebody else. And I'm sure this was you also at some point, Tim, you know, but then having somebody give me a piece of content back and putting it up and having my closest friends say, wow, your video was so good. I love the way your videos always feel. And I asked them questions. They had no idea it wasn't me. (laughs) And that was the best feeling ever. So, yeah. Yeah. I would say that the reason it's hard handing it over is because we are as creators often haven't identified what we do that makes it good. And Mm -hmm. we, it, it really comes down to, I think in order to start creating a scalable team scalable is creating scalable systems uh, we each have a system through which we edit or by which we make decisions and how we handle our inbox and how do we decide that person's worth giving an interview to and that person's not that person's worth a meeting this is this is not worth it this is an opportunity but it's more of a distraction than an opportunity so i'll say no to that we all have filters we have frameworks that we filter everything through Most of us just haven't identified why we cut here and not there and why I'm going to put B-roll there and not over here and why I'm using this type of music now and not that type of music and why that person – like we have those filters. So once we can identify those filters though and start being a little introspective and self-aware, it's like, okay, like while you're editing, just stop. Like why do I want to cut here and not there? Well – Boom. There's a principle. Like write that one down. That's like, like that should go on a checklist that you hand off to another off an editor. What why is uh h- how do I help uh, my my executive assistant take over my email for me um, when she doesn't know who I have relationships with and what kind of relationships I have with each of these people and how to respond? Like what can I what kind of system can I put in place that would well, okay, how about she just goes and searches the archive of my email? to see what prior conversations I've had with this person, read those prior conversations, and now they have an idea of what type of relationship I have with this person. And and if they're just writing, pretending like they've known me for years, or if they actually have known me for years, right? So um, there's, there's ways to solve all of these. And a book I would highly recommend is called E-Myth, uh, E-Myth Revisited. It's why most small businesses fail I think it's the subtitle or something, uh, but in there they talk a lot about creating these types of systems and and uh, that's what makes it scalable. That when you have a good process with a good checklist that's that you can hand off to someone um, and now they can go through that checklist and get like Sam was saying like eighty percent ish of the results you would have gotten. If it might not be a hundred percent, but no one's going to notice the other twenty except for you. <laughs> Every week, we like to wrap up these episodes with a power tip, something practical you can use on your channel right now. And this week's power tip is to do what we actually said in this episode and read those two books that we mentioned. Uh, is Primal Branding by Patrick Hanlon about how to develop cult-like audiences and followings around your around your your channel and your brand and make it easy for people to fall in love with you. So, And identifying those things so that you can update and refresh them every year and a half to two years so your brand stays fresh, your content stays fresh. And the second one is to read that book E-Myth by Michael Gerber is why most small businesses don't work and what to do about it. Read that book or listen to the audiobook on that one. That one was great for me too. Uh, so helpful. Uh, and it's definitely a classic mm-hmm. in the business world. So you want to read that one if you want to create a scalable YouTube channel as well. So read both of those books. We'll put links to both of them in the show notes here. Thank you for hanging out and we will see you guys again next week for another Video Creators Podcast episode. See you then. Bye.